Well, if you've been coming to KAC for a while, you know that usually I always begin my message with an opening illustration. It's a story that connects to the main point or the message in some capacity to help us as a memory aid. And often that illustration comes from either personal experience or the news, because those are, are well, that's what I have. <laughs> so that's where they come from. But this morning, our illustration doesn't come from those sources. This morning, our illustration comes straight from the text of Scripture. Now, it's a bit of a lengthy story, but because we're just going to look at it from the, for the purposes of this opening illustration, I'm going to skip through and only read some selected verses, and then we'll pray as we always do before we jump into our study text in Luke 10. And we're going to jump into Luke 10 because we're in the middle of a series called The Work. It's based in the opening half of Luke chapter 10, and it might seem bizarre then to begin with something from elsewhere in Scripture. But as I explain it, I want to invite you all to remember everything you've learned so far in this series on the work, because this illustration embodies some of the principles of the work that Jesus has been appointing his disciples to, including us. Not all of the principles, but some of them. And this illustration is from Genesis chapter 18 and 19. The story concerns two towns. Sodom and Gomorrah, and it concerns two people, Abraham, who is the original Hebrew, the forefather of the Jewish faith, and Abraham's nephew Lot, who lives in the town of Sodom. It concerns them and it concerns some visitors that come to them, because Abraham was camping near the great trees of Mamre, beyond the vast plain of the Jordan River. And verse 2 of chapter 18 says, Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. Well, that caught Abraham's attention because, first of all, he didn't live in the city. He lived some distance away, and he, where he was living, it was warm. It's hot there. It's, uh, we figure that it was late spring or early summer, probably about this time of year, and it's very, very warm, and you don't want to be standing in the heat of the day in the fullness of the sun. And so Abraham, ever the gracious host, invites them to, to come where he is under the shade of the trees. He says, let a little water be brought. And then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Well, the three visitors agree to Abraham's uh, invitation. And as they, they sit down with him under the shade of that tree and they, as they eat and drink what Abraham saw, uh, brought before them, they began to talk. And they began their conversation with a blessing. They promised Abraham that, they would, that, that the Lord would return a year from then and that Sarah would have a son, something that Abraham longed, hoped for. And as they talked, Abraham realized that these were no ordinary visitors. In fact, they were no ordinary men at all. One of them was the Lord incarnate, and the other two were angels that only looked like men. Verse 16 of Genesis 18 says, When the men got up to leave, they looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him, for I have chosen him, so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what? He has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin so grievous, that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me, and if not, I will know. The men turned away and went towards Sodom, Scripture says, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. And what happens next is the first biblical account of intercession. Intercession, if you've never heard that word, is urgent prayer on behalf of another. Verse 23 says, Then Abraham approached him, it's the Lord, and said to the Lord, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? And if you know this story, you know that it almost sounds like Abraham begins an argument with God, going back and forth for the sake of his nephew Lot, who he knew lived in Sodom, and for the people that Lot knew there. Abraham says, what if there are 50 righteous people in the city? 
Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? And when the Lord says, well, sure, I'll spare the city for the sake of 50, then Abraham begins bargaining for 45 and then for 40. And he keeps dropping the line down, all the way down to 10. And finally, the Lord says, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the chapter concludes with this comment. It says, when the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. Meanwhile, the two angels walked down to Sodom. And I remember that Sodom and the whole plain of Jordan was a well-watered and fertile place, a paradise among the scrub-like territory that surrounded it. And Genesis 19 begins, it says, the two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening. So it took them some number of hours to walk there. And sadly, while the angels were welcomed into the city by Abraham's nephew Lot, just as the visitors had been welcomed by Abraham, the two angels were not welcomed by the men of the city. In fact, the men of Sodom thought to do most very wickedly to those that God had sent to them in his name. And the outcry that the Lord had heard against Sodom was justified. And the end of the story is imagined even before you get to it. The angels tell Lot to quickly gather his loved ones, and they say, get them out of here because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against his people is so great that he sent us to destroy it. And surprisingly, even with that admonition, only Lot and his daughters are ultimately spared. Verse 24 of Genesis 19 records God's judgment on Sodom, Gomorrah, and the smaller villages of the area. It says, then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. You probably wish that I didn't have an opening illustration that had fire and brimstone in it. Kind of a harsh opening, really, for a message. But this is what the Lord would have us to have in mind as we begin today, because this well-known biblical story is the key to understanding our study passage in Luke chapter 10. But before we turn to Luke, as we always do, let's again tune our hearts to Him through prayer. Father, You know the days that we live in. You know that in our day, our cities, our communities are arguably just as wicked as Sodom and Gomorrah ever was. Father, we hear this opening illustration. We read the pages of Scripture. And Father, we tread into this message understanding that this is a solemn thing. Understanding, Lord God, that you are, that you are preparing us for a work that you will do. Father, prepare our hearts now. That when we leave here, Father God, we would leave in tune with you. That we would leave going about your work. Father, that we would be changed for having encountered you through your word. We give you glory. Amen. Amen. Turn now in your Bibles. If you didn't bring a Bible, by the way, there's a Bible ahead of you in the pew there. To the Gospel of Luke, the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Luke there is the third gospel in the New Testament. Luke chapter 10. We're picking up in this series where we left off last week. Now last week we got up to verse 11. Recall as you turn there that in our series on Luke, the Lord has been telling us about how to go about the work that He appoints to all of His disciples. And through verses 1 through 11, He told us to start with prayer for our sake to count the cost in knowing that there's going to be spiritual opposition to the work, to begin with blessing when we encounter others, to continue in a relationship, eating and drinking what is set before us, because that's the heart of the matter is this relationship, and then to reveal the kingdom. To reveal the kingdom. Five steps in bringing the good news to those who welcome us. And as we gained last week, also to those who do not welcome us. 
And all those earlier messages are on our YouTube channel if you want to revisit them or if you missed one of them. And today we're picking up in verse 12. And even as your eyes land on that verse, you immediately see why I started with that opening illustration. Because Luke 10, starting in verse 12, Jesus tells all of us who He appointed the work that we should we be rejected by those that He sends us to, Jesus says, I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Let that sink in. It will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town, than for the town that does not welcome those that God sends to them in His name. And the question jumps to the forefront of our minds, what day then is Jesus speaking of? What is that day? Well, let's back up a little bit here because the answer to that particular question too is alluded to in the scriptural context of last week's passage. Look at verse 10. Jesus said, But when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that sticks to your feet we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. And from that, we can ascertain that the that day that Jesus is speaking of here in verse 12 is the day the kingdom of God fully arrives. The day the kingdom of God fully arrives because Jesus sends all of his disciples to reach others, to go and reveal the kingdom of God. And if they're not welcomed by those that he sends them to, on the day the kingdom of God arrives, on that very day, it'll be more bearable for Sodom than for that town. This day, and up until that day, and we don't know when that day exactly is, but up until that day, we go to folks by Jesus' divine command. We go by Jesus' divine providence. We go to them in His timing, and we minister and testify to them that the kingdom of God is near. It is near to them. It is near because we who are already in the kingdom are right there with Him. We belong to Him. We belong to the King of Kings. We've already said yes to Jesus. He's put His Holy Spirit in us. And we belong to Him. And we're right in front of Him at that moment. And so we can say the kingdom is near because the kingdom is inside us. The kingdom of God, therefore, is near to them. Because when we are in Christ, He is in us by His Spirit. And where the King is by His Spirit, there the kingdom is near. But when the king himself breaks into our domain of earth from his domain of heaven, on that day, the kingdom is in reality, physical reality. Because wherever the king is, there the kingdom is. And all of the prayer that we do, all of the wrestling with the cost that we, that we embark on, all of our fellowship, all of our ministry, all of our teaching and revealing aspects of His kingdom, all the work that Jesus has for His disciples is to prepare others for that day. To prepare others for the day of His arrival. That's what we're about. For the day He comes... The day His flawless holiness physically comes into our domain from His domain of heaven. On that day, it'll be more bearable for Sodom than for the town that rejected those that Jesus sent to them in advance. Friends, God is coming. God is coming. God Most High, full of glory and majesty. The One who speaks and it is. The One who makes mention of it and is certain. The Creator of everything you can see and everything you cannot see. Before whom go majesty and wealth and honor and power and wisdom and strength. God Most High, the Lord Himself, is coming here. He's coming here to this earth from His domain of heaven to our domain, from heaven where His will is already flawlessly done to earth where His will will be flawlessly done. Better than I can say the word flawlessly, apparently. 
On that day, it's going to be wonderful for us who've said yes to Jesus. It's going to be fantastic for us who have said yes to Him, who have washed our sins away through the blood of Christ. Because for us who have already called on His name that day, who uh, is going to be euphoria. It's going to be gladness. We're, our King is here. Our King is here. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's going to be a great day for us. But how horrible that very same day is going to be. For those who have rejected him. For those who have put out a not welcome sign by rejecting those that he sent to them to tell them that he's on his way. Because they rejected him. In rejecting him incarnate in his disciples, they refused even the hope of his kingdom. And yet on that day, there he is. In full reality in power, right in front of them. What will happen then to those who said not welcome, to even the smallest of glimmers of the reality of God who is coming? You know, it's of interest to us, I think, that in our present day, the plain where Sodom and Gomorrah used to be south of the Dead Sea is no longer a well-watered and fertile place. Today, it is an arid wasteland. And I'm told, and I've seen videos where people go there and they visit it, and they dig around, and they can find balls of brimstone still. Brimstone, by the way, is just the old word for sulfur. Except that sulfur in that place isn't like all the sulfur that people dig up in sulfur mines. Because all the sulfur that we dig up in sulfur mines is yellow-green. But this stuff is white. And you can pick it up out of the ground and you can light it with a match. And it melts into this black goo and burns with a bright blue flame like natural gas or something. And Jesus says on that day, it'll be more bearable for Sodom than that town. Recall Genesis 19. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord of the heavens. Thus, He overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. Bible scholars tell us us that that would have been tens, if not a hundred thousand people. Gone. Burned up. Perished in the hail of stone and flame. It's a horrible, horrible end. And so when the gospel is rejected, friend, weep. Weep for those who reject the gospel. Weep for those who turn from the great name of the one who sends you to them. Weep all the more if the town that you are sent to happens to be a town where you know people in, as Lot knew his neighbors. As Lot knew his co-workers. As Lot knew all that he met at the store week by week. Eternity is at stake here. Everything is at stake. More than life and death. This is an eternal matter. So let us be about doing the work, about rescuing all that we come to. Let's rescue the perishing so that they may be saved on that day. So that they might rejoice when the King comes and not cower in fear. Let us pray for our families and for our neighborhood and for our community and for our city to receive the King of Kings when He comes on that glorious day so that all may welcome Him in His holiness with exceedingly great joy, not in ruination. These things in mind, Jesus cries out, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. Did you know that the Lord sent prophets to Tyre and Sidon for many, many years? They came and they spoke to the town. They said, hey, 
Judgment's coming. You can't keep carrying on the way you've been carrying on. You need to get ready. You need to get serious. God is coming. Judgment will fall upon you if you're not serious about your walk with the Lord. But they did not repent. And then he sent the Assyrians against them, but they did not repent. And then he sent the Babylonians against them, who subjugated them, but they did not repent. And then he sent the Greeks to them, who utterly destroyed them. And then he sent the Romans, who took over their land and occupied the cities. And Jesus says, and you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. Hear the word of the Lord. He who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. But he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Friends, Jesus appoints us to the work of prayer, the work of counting the cost, the work of blessing and fellowship and revealing the kingdom, both to those who welcome us and to those who do not welcome us. But while we do the work that he's appointed to us, he is doing his work. It's not that he sends us while he stands back and watches and listens to see what happens. No, he's right there with us. And he's doing his work at the same time, his solemn work of preparing to do his fearsome work, his great and solemn and most very fearsome work. The work that he must do alone, the work that only he can do, the work of utterly destroying all that his enemy has wrought and all who align themselves with his enemy, Satan. Because this we have to understand, friends. Jesus does not appoint us to the work just so that other folks can see miracles. As wonderful and as awesome as miracles are, that's not why he's doing this. He does not appoint us to the work of ministering and healing others for the sake of healing alone. As wonderful and as amazing as healing ministry is, that's great. If you've ever been divinely healed, it's tremendous, it's wonderful. But that's not really the point. He doesn't even send us to others so that others might know and see and have an appreciation of God's power at work in their lives. But rather, He sends us. And we see all those results of the work that He has for us as laudable ministry results because that's what they are. But Jesus says that's not the final objective at all. But all those things, all the work that we do to reveal the kingdom is that they might understand that God is coming. That they might understand that there is a king, that God is real, and that they might repent. That they might repent. That they might turn from wickedness and to him. That they may say, Lord, forgive me for who I've been. Forgive me for what I've done. Turn, I turn to you, Lord, receive my sin and give me your righteousness that I would be yours. That I would be one of your subjects, one of your children. All we do in the work is just precursors of that day. He seeks not the amazement of others. He seeks not the size of the crowds. He seeks repentance. That's what Jesus is looking for. He's looking for repentance. He says if the miracles that were performed in those towns had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Our Lord seeks repentance because the kingdom is about the king not the signs. The kingdom is about the king, not the signs, not the crowds. And Jesus then appoints us to the work because he's looking for those who will see and know and understand that he is, he's breaking into our reality. And in light of that, they would say, oh, I want God. I want to leave this reality and step into his reality. I turn from my wickedness and my selfishness and I turn and bow my knee to him. And I say, Lord, you're my God. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus wants followers. He wants worshipers. He wants more disciples. And so He sends us out, us who are already His disciples, though, so that by His Spirit working in us, we would do the work and we would find more disciples. So that others would become His disciples, so that when He arrives, He would find faith on the earth. That's why He appoints us to the work. 
After all, this land, this, this domain that we live in, this earth, this, this community, this is all under the control of the evil one. As we saw last week from 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are children of God and the whole world is under the control of the evil one. But praise the Lord, he does not allow the evil one to retain control. In fact, since the day mankind fell to Satan's schemes, the Lord has been calling people back to himself and has purpose to come here to take our whole domain back for his glory. And even today, he seeks as many as will reject the way of the enemy and join him in his mission to rescue as many as possible of those that he made in his own image. And that is the work that we are about. Making disciples for God Most High through Jesus Christ before that day. Before the day of His arrival. To that end, Richard Owen Roberts once wrote, Repentance is the first word of the Gospel. Repentance is the first word of the Gospel. The first word of the good news that God is coming to establish His eternal kingdom. To make it the way it was always supposed to be. So that we would live forever in peace. That we would not know disease. That we would not know what cancer is. That we would forget about all the things that hindered us and limited us. That we would never age another day. But that we would live with health and strength and incorruptible and immortal bodies for the glory of His name. And that everywhere we go, people would embrace that and we would bring more and more and more glory to His name in what we do. That's what He's purposing to do. Bring about that day. His kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. As Jesus Himself once preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. The king seeks repentance. And friends, I don't think we understand the real impact of our repentance. I don't think we really understand the impact of our repentance. Because just like our sin affects everyone else around us, everyone in our circles is affected when we sin, when we disobey and disrespect God, so also our repentance affects all those around us. Look again at Christ's words there in verse 13. He says, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! And you, Capernaum! I mean, what are we reading there? Are those individuals? Is Chorazin a woman's name? Is Bethsaida a man's name? Is Capernaum a plumber? So what, what are we reading here? These are not individuals, friends. These are towns. They're towns. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah were towns. Just as Tyre and Sidon were cities. Hear this, friends. This is truth. God in the flesh is coming. And when He arrives, He comes in judgment. He comes to wrest away control of the whole world from the evil one. And He does that in and through judgment. And that judgment will have a devastating impact on towns. On entire communities, just as it did with Sodom and Gomorrah. In our present context, he might as well have said, Woe to you, Kingston! Woe to you, Bath! And you, Amherst View! Can we really be passive and lackadaisical about the work that he's appointing to us when we know that he sees repentance as a community issue, not just an individual issue? Maybe that strikes you as a new idea. I know most often we... In our society, we think of repentance as a strictly individual matter. I mean, after all, it starts with me, right? It starts with you. But while it starts as an individual matter, it does not remain an individual matter. We limit it as such in our minds because we live in an individualistic society. But in real life, we all have impact on each other. We all have impact on each other because we live in a society, not in isolation and so what we do and how we act and what we say and what we, where, where we go, all these things, our lives have impact beyond ourselves. Besides, is it enough? Would it be enough if you and I knew that it would just be us and maybe just one or two of our closest family members? Is that enough to be saved? 
Is that enough? I mean, consider, I mean, really consider this. Lot lived in Sodom all those many years. He lived in Sodom all those many years, and he brought no one to a, to a living relationship with God. He brought no one into that living relationship with God. He brought only his daughters with him out of Sodom. His own wife didn't follow him out of the city. She turned back. And everyone he knew otherwise perished. So tell me, if you've read Genesis 19 in the past, tell me, how wonderful was his life when he got out of Sodom? Because he got out, right? He was rescued. He got saved from judgment, right? That's true. But if you know the story, and friend, if you don't know the story, read it this afternoon. Because if you know the story, you know he barely got out alive. He was rescued from the flames by the skin of his teeth, as it were. And all those years he lived among the people of the city, and he brought none of his neighbors with him. He brought none of his co-workers with him. All he ever had was destroyed. Every neighbor, every co-worker in his fields, he wound up living in a cave. And even then, he offered no hope for a better life to what was left of his family. His is a very sad, sad story indeed. A warning to us all. Friends, we have a responsibility to our community, not just ourselves. We have a responsibility to our community, not just ourselves. Remember that God had committed beforehand to Abraham that if just ten, if there's just Ten people who were righteous in that place, the Lord would spare the whole place for that. But by my reckoning, that means that if Lot had just reached ten folks, if he had just reached ten people for God, Sodom might well have been spared to our day. You know, though Jesus doesn't just see us. He doesn't just look at you and I. He sees our towns. He sees our villages. He sees our communities. He sees your whole circle of influence and seeing all the many lost people in the circles of influence that you and I have. He appoints us to His work. And that work is appointed to us for the sake of all in our sphere of influence. It is for those we live with and among. It is those it is for those we work with and among. It is for those we visit with and among. It is for those that we are sent to and those sent to us. And more than that, it has impact even beyond them because the presence of Christ in us makes us salt as well as light. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit that God seals us with has a preserving effect and consequently judgment on our neighborhood and our community and on our city and on our family is postponed just as the Lord held off judgment on Sodom until Lot was safely out. Sometimes I wonder if those in our circles would live slightly more blessed lives if we would walk a little closer to God ourselves. Because here is truth. Your relationship with with the Lord, impacts those around you in ways that you and I cannot even imagine. It impacts those around you in ways that you and I cannot imagine. Consider that when a husband turns to the Lord, is not his whole house blessed? If just one husband turns to the Lord, is not the whole house blessed? It is, and all who live with the man. Peace begins to reign in the home because gone are the harsh words when they repent. Gone is the financial and spiritual cost of ungodly habit when they repent. When a parent turns to the Lord, are not the children blessed? The children didn't do anything. But they blessed and all who know the couple. My wife's own testimony was that, was that when she was a young girl, she saw the difference that repentance made in the lives of her parents to help bring her to Christ. Blessing came to that house because of new godly priorities that were birthed by her parents' repentance. When a political leader repents, are not all who live within their jurisdiction blessed? They are. Because gone is the cost of of corruption. Gone is the ungodly thinking that leads to wasteful decisions. And these things are so, friends, because repentance always has a much wider blessing 
than just the repentee. I'm going to get in trouble later because I don't think repentee is a real word. Let's just say this. Repentance always results in a wider blessing than just the one who is blessed. It always has a wider impact. There's always collateral blessing. Collateral blessing. We know what collateral damage is, right? This is just the opposite. Collateral damage is when damage is meant to be inflicted, but that damage changes the environment for others who are nearby, and they get hurt because of it. As when Lot hesitated leaving Sodom, the angels grabbed his hand and led him and his family to the edge of the city. And Genesis 19.17 says, As soon as they brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives! Don't look back! Don't stop anywhere in the plain! Flee to the mountains! Or, and listen, or you will be swept away. Or you will be swept away. Lot had to go not just to the edge of the city, he had to go past the edge of the city because the whole plain the city was in was going to get ruined. And if he didn't go far beyond, he and his would become collateral damage. Collateral blessing is just the opposite of collateral damage. It's when the blessing of God is poured out instead of judgment, and the blessing of God changes the environment for the better. And that impacts others for the better. Some of you grew up in godly homes. Godly homes. Now, notice that I say godly, not just Christian. Because some of you grew up in Christian homes that were not very godly. And you were hurt by it. But some of you grew up in godly homes. And you know what I speak of by personal experience because the spiritual blessing that fell on your parents for their obedience and their repentance spilled off onto you long before you had your own relationship with Jesus Christ. Perhaps as a young person you even cared nothing for the things of God. And yet you lived in a house of peace and you enjoyed the blessing of God's peace because what was given to your parents spilled off onto you. That's collateral blessing. By the way, friends, that's another great reason why you want to become a member of a church. Not just come to it, not just adhere to it, but become a member. You want to be part of it so that the blessing that is on the godly leadership would spill off onto you. Whether we repent or not speaks of our community as well of ourselves, and whether we repent or not impacts our community as well as ourselves. And knowing all these things from what Jesus said, this message has three applications for us. Three applications, three things we have to apply in our lives in the here and now. Because surely the Lord, in His divine timing, has given this message to us here and now for His purposes. So that we and our community would be blessed. So firstly, and most obviously, as we look through Genesis, uh, Luke chapter 10, verses 12 to 16, we've got to know that if there's anything between us and the Lord, we need to repent. If there's anything between you and God, you need to repent. You need to turn from your wickedness and to Him. Give up your sin. Give up that ungodly habit. Give up that besetting thing. That thing that you, that you know dishonors Him, and yet you turn to it. You come back to it again and again and again. Confess it to Him. He'll forgive you. You say, I've done that before. Well, then do it again, friend. He will keep forgiving you as often as you turn to Him. Make sure there's a small, or ideally nothing, between you and Him. Keep short accounts with God, is what preachers of yesterday used to say. Call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness. For salvation is found in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Jesus is faithful. He will forgive you. He forgives all who come as often as we come to Him because His sacrifice on the cross is sufficient for all of us. Praise the Lord. So that's our first application. Our second application is for the rest of us who are walking with God. We have to intercede. You have to pray for others. Pray for the lost. Pray for the lost of Kingston. Pray for the lost 
of Bath, pray for the lost of Amersview and Charlotte Lake and, and, and Sydenham and Grenoble and all the other villages and places where you live and visit. Plead with God for the sake of the lost living in our county and our country, just as Abraham did for those living in Sodom. Come to him in prayer, not just for you and for your family, but for the lost around you. So that they too might be saved. So that in the days ahead, we might all worship the Lord in gladness. Perhaps the Lord will yet be gracious and give us more time to reach them. Plead for them. Plead God's mercy upon them. That they would even hear that though they're dead in their trespasses and sins, the Lord would quicken their spirit to hear the good news. Because unless the Father draws them, no one can come to Him. Plead with Him for more time to do the work He's appointed to us for their sake, as well as our own. And finally, do the work. Do the work. Do the work that Jesus appoints to all of us as His disciples. He said, He who listens to you, listens to me. He who rejects you, rejects me. He who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. So do the work. Remember all that you've gained from Luke chapter 10, these 16 verses. Start in prayer. Count the cost. Begin with blessing. Continue in relationship. Reveal the kingdom. Reveal the kingdom through healing ministry and if and when necessary. In cooperation with the Holy Spirit, reveal the kingdom through prophetic act. Don't wait for others to do it. Don't wait for someone else to do the work for you. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you know Him as your Lord, if you've been washed of your sin by His shed blood on the cross, then friend, the work is for you. And Jesus is appointing you to the work because you're His disciple. I don't care if you've been in the, in the kingdom for one day or for 50 years or more. The work is for you for all the disciples. So don't hold back. Pray for more workers. Not just for Jesus to be aware of the need of more workers. Of course He's aware. But so that you would be encouraged that others are helping you in the work. Be prepared for the inconvenience of doing the work. Count the cost. Know that there's spiritual opposition. There's a reason why there's a, always a, some Something in your life that makes you want to procrastinate, that makes you want to put it off. There's a, there's a reason for that spiritual opposition. Count the cost and overcome it. And when by divine appointment you, you go and by divine providence you have a place to go and by divine timing you are welcomed, then bless. Bless those around you. Bless and bless and bless them more. Give peace to those who have no peace. That's why Jesus gives you His peace. You know that, right? It's not just given to you so you can go, oh, I love it. This, God's given me such peace. Well, then give that peace to others. He's given it to you so you, you might have something to give to others. Even if you have no money, you have His peace, do you not? And if you don't have His peace, then come to Him in prayer. And wait with Him in prayer. He will give you His peace. He says, my peace I give to you. He will give you His peace so that you have something to give to those around you. Bless those around you and in fellowship with them. Eating and drinking what is set before you. Build relationships because relationships is the heart of the matter. And when after a while, after a while of eating and drinking with them, after a while of building relationships with them, when they begin to perceive something of Christ in you and you begin to perceive something of their heart need in them, when you've done enough relationship work to do that, then you can minister to them in prayer knowing that Jesus will meet their need because that is why you're there to reveal the kingdom. So know that God is with you in this. He's not forsaking you in this. He says, I am with you always for this reason to do the work. In Jesus' own words, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you and even if they reject you even then as you wipe the dust off, the, off their town off your feet with tears in your eyes say the kingdom of God is near near and right at the door the eternal and everlasting reality of God most high breaking into our reality and in his great grace to us he pauses 
so that we might reach more of those he made in his image. Let's pray. Father, we give you glory. We give you glory, Lord, that you would wait for us to do the work. That you would give us to, to us who are your disciples the opportunity to do the work. That you don't, you don't just reach us and, and then translate us to heaven. You give us this space, this opportunity, this lifetime, as long or short as it is, that we would be with you in the work that we would be used of you in the work, that we would be blessed through the work, that we would be eternally compensated for having been part of the work. Father, that we would have the, the wonder and the joy of seeing your kingdom grow right in front of our eyes. Father, you've given us this season for this reason. Let us grasp the season. Oh, Lord, give us the names of those you're sending us to. Show us in our, in, in, through visions, through dreams, Father God, through, through a word on a piece of paper, somehow, Father God, speak to us that we would know who you would have us to speak to, to build a relationship with, to reveal the kingdom to. Father, that we would see people healed, people delivered, people saved, people stepping into re the reality of life with you even before that wonderful day you appear and bring your kingdom with you. For wherever you are, there is your kingdom. Father, we give you glory and we give you thanks. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. We're going to stand and sing and then we're going to have a time of communion.